Okay, back to the sermon. Now, I've been preaching on what on earth am I here for and to really hear our calling and what we're supposed to do. Just like Joe, who's saying, man, God really pierced my heart during this time to really step out. Many of us are being just stretched and we're growing and we're saying, wow, Lord, what do you have for me? And today I really want to share that God has a mighty word for us. God has a work for us to do. We need to reclaim our community. I don't know about you. I'm sick and tired of the violence. I'm sick and tired of the pain that our city is in because they are people that are dying to know Jesus. People are begging to be saved. People are out there saying, please throw me a lifeline. And you and I, we need to reclaim our community. Now I want you to know that we've been praying for our community. Do you know that our community, the violence, the crime rate has gone down drastically this year? But we used to be at a 20, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst, we were a 20. So now we're at 10, <laughs> meaning we're still at the worst, but we're twice better. And, and, and we're getting in the right direction. But I really want to teach on how to reclaim our community, how to take back what the devil stole from us. I don't know about you, I'm tired of the devil coming into my house, into this house, in the people's house, in our community, and taking our husband or our wife, our son or our daughter, our father, our mother, our brother, our sister, our neighbor, our friend, and destroying lives. And it's time we say, you know what, devil? Out with you and in with God, and we're going to claim our community. Amen. Now, for you theologians, don't get all stressed and don't get all mad and don't write me letters. Oh, you took too much liberty with the scripture. The, the Sermon on the Mount is when Jesus preached and he gave these amazing principles and some of them are, are what we know as the Beatitudes. Blessed are. And then he went on from there in Matthew chapter 5 at verse 13 and he says these words, you are the salt of the earth. He goes, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Now, all of a sudden, a lot of people heard him preach that day, and they heard him receive the word, and they heard him take it in, and they heard him hold on to it, and all of a sudden, man, they're leaving and they're going, and now there's this religious leader that approaches Jesus. And it's found in Luke chapter 10. Starting at verse 25 through 29, he says, One day an expert, this guy's an expert in religious law, stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Now he's testing the Lord. So you can hear his attitude, you can hear his little, and he says, Teacher, you can just hear him like, Teacher, like I'm the expert, but teacher... What should I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus replied, well, what does the law of Moses say? And then he asked a real heavy question. He goes, and how do you read it? You see, the word of God is very clear, but you and I read it how we want to read it a lot of times. Have you ever found that to be true? We accommodate it to us. We want to make it like, well, I don't think God meant like love our neighbor, love our enemies. I don't think he meant like our enemies' enemies. Not like these guys. Are, are you with me? Haven't we ever accommodated the Word of God to accommodate it to us and make it fit real comfortable where we don't have to deal with conviction and we feel okay? So look, look back to the Scripture. Okay. So the man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus replies, Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Now look at this. Look at verse 29. The man wanted to justify his actions. Say justify. Because many times you and I want to justify our actions. So he asked Jesus, can you hear his sarcasm? And who is my neighbor? You know, don't you want to just slap somebody? That, of course in a Christian kind of way, but... He's just like, oh, and who's my neighbor? 
who's my neighbor? Who do you want me to love? And he's like, ugh. So that's a question I want to deal with today, is who is our neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Who's your neighbor? My neighbor? Who's your neighbor in your household? Who's your neighbor in your neighborhood? Who's your neighbor in the workplace, at your school? Whatever organization or little group or football or basketball or all those things that you might be a part of, who is your neighbor? Because we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're supposed to reach out to our neighbor. So who is our neighbor? Well, look what Jesus says, starting at verse 30. We're in Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Through 37. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man. Boy, that caught his attention. Why? Because he's Jewish. He's Jewish, so he's like, hey, okay, this guy, okay, he's talking about us. Was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Many people traveled that, and they even do to this day. And they, they're traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho and was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw this man lying there, he crossed on the other side of the road and passed by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed on the other side. Then the despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed the, his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay it the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say? was a neighbor. Man. I mean, that's pretty easy, right? So who would you say is a neighbor? Look what the man replies. <laughs> well, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, yes. Now go and do the same. Father, help us to see in this story the right heart, right attitude, right motive, right conduct that you want, Father God, to really be able to inherit the kingdom of God, to show mercy, show love, show compassion, and show tender care. I pray you minister to us in this time in Christ's name. Amen. Now look, these guys are at the Sermon on the Mount, and they hear Jesus say, you are the salt of the earth. Go salt the earth. And he goes, what did he say? He goes, he said, go assault the earth. So the bandits went out. Da, 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 We're going to assault them. We're going to assault them. And they're waiting for him. You know, this road of Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, even to this day, it's nothing but desert there, okay? I mean, there's no, there might be a little spot of vegetation. Like, when we were down there, we were going on a bus, and, and it's downhill all the way from Jerusalem to Jericho. And there, I mean, we're talking desert, but we're not talking like our desert where you have vegetation. We're talking like sand, dirt, and nothing. And you'd see a bunch of tents, and they're nomads, and they'd even have some goats and some sheep. And you're like, where do they eat? And they go, well, they go take, take them. They find a little place that they could feed them. And, and then, but they go, and there were some caves in there. And they go, there's a lot of bandits on this road, and, and it's a dangerous road even to this day. People get robbed, people get held up and stuff like that. So n not a whole lot has changed from Jesus' time to even today. And these bandits heard, go assault them. Assault them. We're going to assault them. And they came along, and he's coming along. This guy is a Jewish man just minding his own business. He's just going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's all happy. I don't know if he was going to go visit family. Maybe he's on a business trip. Maybe he just came. For, or maybe he lived in Jericho. Maybe, But he is a Jewish man, so they could all identify. And we don't know if he's rich, poor. We just know that he's all happy, minding his own business. And boom, they beat him up. Whom they rob him. Whom they strip him and they leave him for dead. He's half dead, it says. The guys there are beat up, he's naked. They've taken everything from him. These bandits assaulted him. I've said this over and over, and I mean it with all my heart. 
I love the greeters at our front door. They're like always so cheerful, give you a big old smile. Hey, how are you? How you doing? First service, hi, they hug you. Then second service, hi, they hug you. Third service, hi, they hug you. It's, they're just pleasant people at our front door. But once you get in, every once in a while, I don't see this often, but you see some of the bandits. Oh, would you look at the way they came dressed at church? Can you believe they came dressed at church like that? I'm glad it doesn't happen here anyway. But I've heard that happens in some churches. That they start judging people, they start beating them up, and they start beating them up with the way they look, and beating them up with the way they smell, and beating them up with the way they're dressed, and beating them up, oh my gosh, did they, do you think they put enough perfume on? They put enough perfume one time for four days. Do they even know how they smell like? Or man, don't they know about deodorant? Oh my gosh, they really stink. Like, who do you think you are? Going around beating people down, insulting them, and just uh, assaulting them, and tearing up their character, tearing up who they are, tearing up their identity, tearing them up. I thank God that we don't do that here. I thank God that we accept anyone the way they are. Look, one time a guy came testing me. Just like they were testing Jesus, they wanted to test the pastor. The greeters go, go get pastor, go get pastor. So I go out there and I go, hey, how you doing? And there's a guy there at the front door and he didn't have a shirt on. And he's there, hey, I don't have a shirt on. I go, I noticed. <laughs> he goes, can I come into your shirt without a, a church without a shirt? I go, absolutely. It's not a problem. Come on in. And then as he takes a couple steps in, I go, I just do want to warn you ahead of time. Everyone in church, everyone, every single person has a shirt on. <laughs> all the men, all the women, everyone has shirts on. And for the record, I just don't want you to feel out of place because you're, you're not going to have a shirt. You, know, you might feel like, well, that's kind of weird. I'm the only one without a shirt. He goes, wow, you're right, huh? Do you have a shirt? Yeah, we got him a t-shirt, put it on. That guy even got saved that day. But see, we get all shook up. I can't believe you're going to come in like that. Oh, my gosh, calm down. Calm down. There's been people that come in inebriated. That means a little, you know. And they might even smell a little bit like they've been drinking a little too much. We don't get all, you can't come in like that. We just go, okay, we assign someone to them and say, hey, hey, why don't you sit over here? And they sit them in the back. They sit with them. And if they start getting routed and they start getting disruptive, then they take them out. They go minister to them. But we're not going to say, you can't come in, man. You're the one that needs it the most. Amen. Look, there was a guy that came to our church one time. He was like Jonah. He was running from God. He was running from God, and he had left California. He had left a disaster. This guy left with a very, left a beautiful family. His mom and dad, amazing. His marriage had fallen apart. He had gotten divorced. He was just broken. And he got in his car and was running from God, and he came here to Albuquerque, got off the freeway, and he came up I-25 from I-40, and he got off on Montgomery, and he found, and he sees the church, New Beginnings. He goes, man, that's what I need. So he pulled into church, and that Sunday, he gave his life to Jesus. And he told me, man, pastor, I'm all messed up. I'm strung out on heroin and cocaine. I go, well, if, if you really want a new life, and if you really want a new start, we have a ministry that we partner with it's called under his construction and it's a rehab home and and you could go in there and and the pastor's here right now so i go hey pastor chris he's the pastor of that ministry if you're really serious go and he's like okay yeah, i go well we have to search your vehicle make sure you don't have any drugs or weapons or anything well i don't have any weapons but i have drugs and he had some cocaine and heroin and marijuana in his car. So he surrendered it to me, and then I sold it to fund the ministry. And <laughs> okay, for the record, I did not do that. 
I have not, and it did not do that. Some of you guys are like, what happened? I was asleep. That tea, what happens when you fall asleep in church? <laughs> okay, for the record, he did give it to me. No, seriously, he did give it to me. And because I was a chaplain for the police department for a long time, we turned it in, and he went to the ministry. He started sharing his story. Started sharing that he grew up in a Christian home. His mo mom and dad are pastors. To this day, they're pastors. He had backslid. He was going to UCLA. He was a junior in UCLA, had gotten married, married a woman that had our, her master's already, and she went on to get her doctorate. And, and all of a sudden, he ended up hooked on drugs. Lost everything. Lost his home, lost his family, lost his wife, lost his mom and dad, lost everyone. And his life was falling apart, so he got in the car and ran away so he wouldn't bring shame to them anymore. And he said, I was running from God, and who would have thought I ran right into him here in Albuquerque? Well, that guy, you see, we didn't say, we don't accept your kind here. We didn't say, we got to look at your pedigree first. We just said, come as you are, because God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. God transformed his life, and today is his second Sunday as the pastor of Benton Heights Church of God in Michigan. That's Jaime Cervantes, who we just dedicated to the Lord a few weeks ago. You see, God can do anything if we don't assault them. Shame on you if you tear people apart because they look different from you. Shame on you if they don't measure up to your measurements when they do to his. Shame on us. Shame on us if we ever become that. We cannot become the bandits. We cannot become the ones that assault. We cannot become the ones that tear apart. We cannot become the ones that tear down. We cannot become those people. They stripped him. Stripped this man. He was just going along his life and they stripped him. How many of you have been stripped of your dignity? You've been stripped because people have been vicious to you. People have talked about you. They've gossiped about you. They've even gone behind your back or they've gone right to your face. And they've said things that aren't even true, but they're brutal. And they tear you apart. God forbid that we assault people. And if any of you have ever been assaulted by the church, by God's living church, a Christian church, whether it's been New Beginnings or any church, on behalf of every pastor in every church, I apologize. God, forgive us that we hurt you. There's another chance, and give us another chance so we can show you his love and grace. They stripped him. They left him naked there. They beat him. It's bad enough when you're naked. There's some people that love stripping people. God starts raising them up. Man, I'm teaching a class at my church. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm an usher. You ought to see I'm a greeter. I work in the, 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 the church ministry. Man, I help in the children's ministry. I help in the youth. Man, I help in the, the kitchen ministry. You know what? They, they have this ministry where they're, they're ministering to people in the nursing home. You know, they have this, uh, and they have, and they have, and they have, and you start telling them, they go, you, you no good for nothing, drunkard. I'm going to make sure I tell them everything you used to be. Do they know you used to be an alcoholic? Yeah, as a matter of fact, they helped me get off. Do they know that they, and they throw your sin at your face. They get you, strip you naked to make sure everyone knows everything about you. When God already does and you've forgiven, he, you ask them for forgiveness and whom the Son is set free is free indeed because if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. God forbid. He's there beaten. He's naked. Exposed to the world. And they left them to die. God forbid that we ever leave anyone to die. They assaulted him. Then there's another group of people that go, oh my gosh, those ninnies. What's wrong with you? He didn't say go assault the culture. He said go insult it. 
and they insult people. You ever met the ones that insult people? It's right here, verse 31 and 32. By chance, a priest came along, a priest. And he saw the man lying there, and he cr crossed over to the other side of the road and passed him by. My goodness gracious. A priest comes along. Now, it's very evident that he's a priest because they had priest attire on. Now, picture you're the guy that got beat up. You're the guy that got stripped. You're the guy that got left for dead, and you're dying. And I don't know about you, if I'm dying, my probably last words are, Oh, God, please, God, please. I need someone to save me, God. I still have a little bit of life, God, please. Wouldn't you? I know I would. Yeah. And he's crying out. All of a sudden, he looks and goes, Oh, thank you, God, a priest. Thank you, Lord. That looks like the priest from my... My temple, that's where I go to his service. Yeah, the priest. And the priest looks over and sees him lying there. And he goes, man. He doesn't even walk toward him. He saw him and he, and he went completely on the other side. Like, ugh, I don't want to touch that guy. He's naked, he's bloody, he's gory, and he's half dead. And after all, I'm a priest, and if I touch him, it will make me impure, and I'll have to go through a purification ceremony, and I really don't need that. I don't hang around people like that anymore. I am way too good. So you insult them. You insult them by the very fact that you're a minister of the, of the Word of God. You are a priest, a priest that elevates people up, and he instead put them down. This priest looked over at him, and just his look was enough to kill. Has anyone ever given you a look to kill? Man, they didn't have to open up their mouth. They said it loud and clear just by the way they looked at you. You were like, oh, my gosh, if looks could kill. I know where I'm not wanted. Are you with me? They insult you. They just tear you down. They just hurt you. They just wound you. Have you ever been called one of your kind? I'm not going to get into a racial thing here, but I'm just going to tell you the fact. One time, I used to be the national president for the 260 churches. For 10 years, I headed that organization. And one time, we're having a national conference at this facility, and... There was a man there that was really upset that some of the kids were, were walking straight from outside with their tennis shoes to the gym because they wanted to make sure there was no rocks in their shoes because they, they didn't want the floor tore up. But they didn't say, hey guys, can you all make sure that you guys clean the you know, rocks out of your shoes if you didn't bring an extra pair of carry-in tennis shoes because we want to save the floor. Instead, he came over to me, and all the people are there, and he goes, Mansfield! And I go, yeah, well, how you doing, coach? He goes, you better talk to your people and tell your people to hurry up and change shoes. And, my guy. and he went off, and I'm like, whoa, dude, calm down, coach, calm down. And he goes, talk to your people. And I go, well, they speak English. Talk to them in your language. So I turned to all of the people in, in, in English. I told them, guys, maybe if I shout, you'll understand. He doesn't want us. And I explained, I go, look, guys, this is what we need. If you, you wore your tennis shoes, make sure all the little rocks are out. And I explained it to him. And I said, please show the coach how much we appreciate him. And they all applauded for him said, thank you. I want you to know that was hard, though. Because you know how when they hit your people? It's not about race, it's just your people. You could be a whole mixed culture, and they could still refer to you as your people, your kind. They insult you without even knowing they're insulting you. They go, what did I do? See how you people are right away? You guys all get insulted right away, you people. I go, there you go again. 
See, they don't get it a lot of times. And it's not about race. It could be anybody. It could be Hispanics against whites, Hispanics against black. It could be blacks against white. It could be any race against any race. It could even be the same race against their own race. Right? We're Spaniards. You're Mexicans. Que barbaro, man. Like, my grandfather was born in Spain, but they settled in Mexico, so we were Mexicans. My mom was a true mestizo. Her mom was an Indian, her dad was a Spaniard. What does it matter? Because insult is still insult. The priest just shunned himself from them and the guy's going, thank you, God, you sent the priest. And he walks away, God, please, God. And then all of a sudden, look what it says in verse 32. A temple assistant walked over. Thank you, Lord. I guess the priest told the assistant to come over. Thank you. And he looked at him lying there. So he walks up to him and he goes, oh, dude, you're messed up. Help me, please help me. Oh, dude. Oh, they worked you over, man. Dude, they, they, you, you look half dead. I am. Oh, I better go on the other side. Are you dead? I don't, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get dirty. I don't want to spend time and have to invest time in helping somebody. After all, I mean, people have helped me, but I don't really want to help them. Once again, a slap in the face, an insult. How many times does someone need to be slapped in the face before they finally say, I can't take this anymore? They, they quit on God, they quit on his church, they quit on Christians, they quit on everybody. They go, the pain is just too real. Now verse 33. Here comes a man. He heard the message. Be the salt of the earth. He salted him. He salted him. Look what it says, verse 33. Then a despised Samaritan. Say despised. despised. This guy isn't just a Samaritan. He's a despised Samaritan. Now who's he talking to? He's talking to a religious leader. He's talking to the religious leader. And other religious Jews are listening. And they didn't like Samaritans. It's kind of like New Mexicans, how they treat Texans. Just saying, just saying. I came from Texas. Ugh, he's one of those. They want our water. They want our water, and they come in vacation and mess everything up, and then they leave and leave their garbage behind. Man, people don't like Texans. I don't know what it is, man. It's like... Yeah, I love this state. I've lived here longer than any other state, but I'm still a Texan. I go and change that. I was born in Texas. Man, but, but despised Samaritans. They didn't like the Samaritans. They did not like the Samaritans. They hated them so much, Jesus even said, a despised Samaritan. Yeah, yeah, you know what it's like, huh, Jesus? And he came along. And when he saw the man, he saw the man, he saw the man, he saw the man just like the priest did, just like the bandits did, just like the temple assistant did. He saw the man and he felt compassion. Man, you see, that Samaritan knew what it was like to be shunned. He knew what it was like to be assaulted. He knew what it was like to be insulted. He knew what it was like to be beat down. He knew what it was like when they called him, hey, half-breed, because, see, they were mixed. They were Jews and others, and they were mixed, and they were half-breeds. And, hey, he knew what it was like to be treated like garbage, and he knew what it was like to be beaten with words and beaten with attitudes and stripped to nothing where there's nothing left in your going, God, please, I can't take this anymore, and left for dead. The despised Samaritan understood, and he felt compassion. Back to the scripture. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with oil and wine, and 
olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and then he cared for him. And the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. And if there's, if, if this doesn't cover it, you know I'm good for it. Johnny, I'm here all the time. This is my route. I know, I know, Emmanuel. Okay, okay, we got it. I'll, I'll cover anything that, that it doesn't cover. You see, he went over to him. He didn't just go over. And, can you imagine the Jew laying there? And the Jews laying there half dead, naked and beaten and stripped. And here comes a despised Samaritan. What do you think he might be thinking? Really, God? <laughs> Is he going to finish me off? Is he going to take whatever's left of me? Because there's some people that go up there and take whatever's left, but not this despised Samaritan. He went and poured salt. He went and got the salt shaker out, and he started pouring out the love of Jesus. He started ministering. He started emptying himself. And he said, man, I need to pour into this man because I know what it's like to be beaten down. I know what it's like to be stripped. I know what it's like to be left for dead because it happens a lot in my life because I'm a Samaritan, and every time I come up to Jerusalem, they treat me horrible. I know what it's like. I know what it's like. You see, he knew, he understood, he understood his pain, and he said, dude, I'm so sorry. Here, 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 here's some wine, here. Drink, come on, it, it'll be good for you. No, here, take a little more. Okay. And then he got out the oil, and he starts pouring the oil. He's pouring it on him. And, oh, I know it, I know it hurts, but I got I to... Gotta, Dude, you're a mess, man. They, they really took, took you to town. Your heart is so broken, isn't it? I'm healing your broken heart. E, your mind is shattered, isn't it? You don't trust anybody anymore, do you? E, your body has just been wounded. I'm so sorry. And then the guy's like, wow, you're not going to kill me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for stopping. Oh, dude, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. I'm going to help you. Donkey, come here. Here comes a donkey. You know what the donkey's name was, right? Priest and temple assistant. Okay, it really wasn't. I'm just, I'm being a jerk right there. I'm assaulting and insulting. But that's what we're like. We're donkeys when we miss it. We're made fools of it when we miss it. It's right in front of us, needing our help, and we miss it. And he goes, here, get up on my donkey. And he's taking him. Can you imagine what this guy must be thinking? God, you're blowing me away. My own people did this to me. My own people. Then my priest came along and then his assistant came along and now this despised Samaritan. Who would have thought that my enemy would be the one pouring out healing balm on my body? Because when God grabs a hold of your heart, you're no longer an enemy of God and you're no longer an enemy of his people. And he poured himself out. And he poured himself out and he gave and he showed love and he emptied himself and he poured himself out. He did what he had to. You see, the Bible says that when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The devil has a way of calling us by our sin. Have you ever noticed that? Hey, drunkard. Hey, you loser. Hey, you gossiper. Hey, you adulteress. Hey, adulterer. Hey, hey, hey. And you know what God calls us by? Our future. 
The devil called me a drunk and God called me a preacher. And I'm going, I think you got the wrong guy. He goes, no, you just haven't discovered it yet. I'm telling you, love covers a multitude of sin. That doesn't mean we ignore someone's sins. That means once they confess the sin, we cover it. And if someone tries to use it to throw it in their face, you go, no, nah, they'll be throwing this sin in their face. They already have been forgiven. They were that, but they no longer are. So get out of here with that nonsense. You don't let people keep beating people down and hurting them and stripping them and taking everything from them and insulting them, but instead you add salt. Yesterday, I was at the airport coming back home and I went up to the counter to get my ticket and stuff. And as I'm waiting in line, God, the people, there was two families, anyway, they... They were brutal to the two ticket agents. And I'm like, God, it's like, calm down. But you got to see what was happening is, see, there was a lot of storms in the south. Just me going out there, we couldn't land in Atlanta because it was raining so hard and lightning storm that they had to reroute us to Nashville. And we sat on the runway for an hour and 25 minutes. And then we finally flew into Atlanta when the storm went through. And so on the way back, there was a major storm in New Orleans. And so our plane was supposed to be from New Orleans. So now it was going to be delayed an hour and 45 minutes. But they even told the people, I could hear. They go, but your connection is not affected. You'll make your connection. And they were, oh my gosh, treating these people clerks horrible so when i get up there the young lady you know smiled and goes hello and i go thank you so much for that beautiful smile after what you just went through she goes wow well thank you i go on behalf of all the stupid idiot passengers please forgive us please forgive us I go, I know you don't go out of your way to ruin us and making life miserable for us and causing all those storms. I know you don't have that kind of power. And <laughs> she started laughing. And I go, this is what I need. I need to see if you could help me. And she starts, oh, I could do, I could do. And man, and she like is upgrading me and she's spoiling me. And I'm like, and I told her, oh my gosh, I'm in love. <laughs> And she laughed, and I go, I, I love my wife. I'm married, happily married, and I love my wife. But I sure am, you sure are growing on me. <laughs> and she laughed again, and, you know, and she goes, thank you for brightening up my day. I go, I, I've been praying for you since you were going through that. You see, all I tried to do was get the salt shaker out. Add a little bit of flavor to this world that can sometimes be bitter. This world that can sometimes be tough to swallow. It's like, man, what's wrong with us? There's people assaulting, there's people insulting, and we're supposed to be salting. Adding and adding and adding to people's lives. So verse 36, Jesus says, so which of these three would you say was a neighbor? Which of these three do you want to be? The bandits, the priest, the temple assistant, or the despised Samaritan that was transformed by the power of God and showed the mercy of God and the love of God. God forbid that we ever become any of the others, but that we would be the salt of the earth. Amen? Amen. Some of you have not come to Jesus just because you met some very mean people in the church. And I sincerely mean that. If it was a pastor, on behalf of pastors, forgive us. And if it was because of the church, on behalf of the church, forgive us. I really pray that you give Jesus a chance. And if you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to do that today, raise your hand and say, man, that's me. I've never done that. And I want to do that. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Amen. Over here. So if you raise your hand, I, I'm, I'm not going to embarrass you, but would you stand so we could pray with you? It's the greatest decision you're making. I'm going to pray with you. Pray If you want to accept Jesus, just say this prayer, okay? Say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Today, I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. I believe that he died for me, and he paid for my sins, and he rose to give me life. And by faith, I receive that, and I want to walk for you and live for you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, heal every wounded heart. Father God, heal every wounded soul, every wounded mind, every wounded body, in the name of Jesus. Father, restore what the devil has tried to steal from us. I pray, Father God, that you forgive us for being assaulters, you forgive us for being insulters, and that, Father God, that you would help us to bring healing to the pain we cause. Now, Lord, bring restoration as so we reclaim our community. And I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, so and God's people said, Amen.